Hello and welcome to another Vaisala video blog. Today's blog is answering questions that we received during a recent webinar. The webinar was called Cybersecurity in Your GXP Monitoring System. And you can find a link to that webinar recording below. So if you haven't seen it already, um, welcome to watch it. And these are questions that we didn't get to, so we're getting to them now. And welcome to our senior GXP regulatory expert, Paul Daniel. Welcome, Paul. Hi, everybody. Okay, so let's jump right into these questions. First question, I have to access a lot of different systems, each with a different password. Can I use a password manager to manage my passwords in a GMP facility? Ooh, I love password managers. I use them in my personal life. Uh, and this way I can have complex passwords, you know, really secure passwords for all my online accounts, but I only have to remember just the one password to get into the manager. But I haven't really thought about using it for work uh, because here at Vaisala, most of our systems are single sign-on or they use Active Directory. So I get to use the same password everywhere for all my work stuff. I would assume that if you were at a large GXP company, you'd also be single sign-on and you wouldn't need to remember a bunch of passwords. But if you were part of a smaller company, you know, maybe a startup or something, you could end up in this situation. I don't see anything conceptually wrong with using a password manager for, for GMP passwords. You're going to be meeting your, your password complexity requirements. You aren't sharing passwords and technically you aren't writing them down on paper. They are stored you know, virtually in your password manager that's a, a password protected environment with a complex password. Um, and if you never write down the uh, password to your password manager, you've technically met the spirit of the GMP requirements. There might be a logistic problem here because your password manager would need to be installed on your workstation. So you could be violating some company policy some way. Your safest course is probably to bring the idea up to your quality and IT groups and see what they have to say. Okay, thank you. Next question. Does the risk of getting hacked increase if you use a cloud-based monitoring system? Is security better or worse in the cloud? That's, that's a big question because there's so many flavors of cloud out there. It's hard to know where to begin. Um, generally, security is going to be better in the cloud. Um, but to limit the, the scope of my answer, Let's say we're talking about uh, software as a service, you know, where your application is running on a public cloud service like Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services. On one hand, your risk goes down for sure because a good chunk of the infrastructure and programming is coming straight from Amazon or Microsoft. And frankly, they have way more resources, experience and competency than your IT department, especially around security. And on the other hand, your risk will stay the same because you still need to make sure that your implementation of the cloud tool is safe and secure. In the end, you're always still following the same four basic security practices uh, that we covered in the webinar, uh, following user practices with your passwords, demanding security features from vendors in your uh, user requirements documents, uh, selecting competent vendors and auditing them. And the last one, um, following IT best practices when you're managing your IT environment, right? Things like backup and recovery and change control. I think overall, you're going to be safer in the cloud, even though you still have to do the same activities. There's less of them to do, right? Because we've outsourced most of the system and the corresponding security concerns to a cloud provider like Amazon, who's just going to be really good at this. They just have so many resources at their disposal. Now, if we're talking about a cloud that's limited to infrastructure as a service and a model like that, you're still responsible for your server deployment and all the responsibilities that go with that. So in that situation, you're going to have not as low risk as software as a service, but still probably lower risk than a traditional on-premise system. Okay, this next question is similar because it addresses new technologies. The Industrial Internet of Things, IIoT, makes people nervous because it causes systems to jump Purdue model levels which is level two straight to the internet. What can you tell me to make me comfortable with IIoT? If you're like me and you just heard about Purdue models, you're like, what's that? I had to look it up too. 
uh, basically the Purdue model is a way of understanding an industrial control system uh, by separating the, the parts into layers. Uh, layer level two is where controllers and sensors live, say on your, uh, your manufacturing line. And the internet is gonna be somewhere much higher up at like level five. And the asker of this question is basically saying, if I use the industrial internet of things, the, the I, I, IOT, and I use it to empower the sensors on my manufacturing line, aren't I just opening up a portal between the internet and my manufacturing line? And I have to say, I agree, that's pretty risky. You know, this whole webinar was about how to defend a complex server-based system that has a lot of resources and to defend that system from a hacking attack. And we have a lot of known fixes, a lot of resources available for our defense. So we can easily fix any errors. But with the IoT or the IIoT, you're dealing with small devices that don't have a whole lot of resources and honestly might not be able to be upgraded. And we're exposing these devices to potential attacks over the internet. So I don't think there's anything I can say that will make you comfortable with the IoT or the IIoT because I'm not comfortable with it. Until we've got some standardization around security procedures for IIoT devices, I think there's just too much risk. I love the idea of things being networked. You know, we can enhance productivity through interconnection in a private network, but I am not comfortable at all, not with having critical devices exposed to the internet. No doubt we'll see some more progress on this front in the next few years. I mean, it took internet security more than 30 years to get to where it is today. And IIoT security just needs some time to catch up. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take one more question. We'll keep this video blog nice and short, but this one is too fun and also a little scary. So we'll ask it. Does Vaisala pay security companies to audit ViewLink for exploits or offer bounties for found bugs? Bounties? No. Vaisala is not engaged in any arrangements whatsoever to pay bounties for bugs found in our systems. We do pay external security consulting firms to audit our systems to help us identify weaknesses, to help us improve. And our latest round of security updates for ViewLink some of the fixes in there were specifically for issues that we found with the help of a security consulting company. Now, I wouldn't normally describe it as looking for exploits, but since it did help us fix some flaws, I suppose it isn't incorrect to say we hired them to find exploits. But as far as offering bounties for found bugs, I, I really want to be clear on this, that this isn't something Vaisala is doing, and you should not try and hack Vaisala or any other company for that matter. Um, if you hope that you're going to find a weakness or bug in the system that you'll be able to convince your target to pay you to learn about this bug, um, that's more or less a criminal act. Uh, it's an unsanctioned attack um, that is criminal in just about every nation. And if a company is really intending to pay bounties for bugs, I'll let you know by getting involved in one of the legitimate marketplaces out there that broker this kind of services. So don't hack Vaisala. Um, so to wrap that up, we do hire external security companies to help us improve, but we are not paying for bounties. Don't try and hack us. Yes, well, that's a good note to end on. And thank you to everyone who attended the webinar. Um, this was a learning exercise for us and a lot of fun to do. And we appreciated everyone who showed up live with their questions and we're glad to have this opportunity to answer them for you. If you have any more questions, you can email Paul and uh, we have his email below. And yeah, send us any questions that you have. We learn a lot from your questions. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you again. Happy holidays.